Supergirl, Batgirl, Hawkwoman, Nemora. For several of history's biggest male superheroes, there have been female counterparts. Were these female versions an actual part of the creative process that brought deeper meaning to the original character? Or were they just created in an attempt to diversify and reach a wider audience? We may never know. What we do know is that in 1976, the bionic woman spun off of her male counterpart, the $6 million man. It was an old trick, but it still worked. And when Stan Lee saw that, he realized that Marvel didn't actually have the copyright on Spider-Woman, or She-Hulk for that matter. So any publisher could just create a character named Spider-Woman and cash in on all the hard work that they've done with Spider-Man over the years. So he tasked Archie Goodwin, he said, Archie, create Spider-Woman. And in February of 1977, Archie teamed up with Sal Buscema and Jim Mooney for Marvel Spotlight number 32. This was the first appearance of Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman herself. Spider-Man actually didn't even make an appearance, instead making way for Nick Fury and Hydra to play larger roles. But it seems that Spider-Woman is an agent of Hydra, and she's after Nick Fury for capturing her boyfriend. So she busts in and wrecks everyone. She's about to end Fury when he shows her a tape of her beloved Jared being the bad guy, because he's Hydra. She confronts him and he's like, you're gross. You're disgusting. Don't touch me. I was ordered to be your lover, and I hated every minute of it. Because, oh yeah, she's just gross. Who wouldn't want to be with her? So now she's out to get Hydra. But before she does, the Hydra leader, Count Otto Vermis, reveals to her her origin. And since her name is Spider-Woman... Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. But it turns out that she was actually created by the High Evolutionary and evolved from a spider. But even among his new men, she was ostracized. She left and found a new life and then accidentally killed her first boyfriend, and that trauma led to her being manipulated by Hydra in the first place. Now I have to say, this is just her first appearance, uh, because afterwards, retcons upon retcons upon retcons would talk about her origin, starting with her very next appearance. This issue of Marvel Spotlight was supposed to be a one-off, just to secure the legal rights to the name Spider-Woman. Public feedback to her was so great that a few months later she got an arc in five issues of Marvel 2-in-1 written by Marv Wolfman. Then a few months after that, Wolfman teamed with Carmine Infantino for Jessica Drew's first ongoing series, Spider-Woman number 1, making the first appearance of her costume with the hair, which honestly looks much better in my opinion. That series would run up to 50 issues and inspire an animated series also called Spider-Woman. It had 16 episodes, which is probably more than the cartoon based off of You Got. With the end of her comic series, Jessica Drew would make guest appearances across the Marvel comics for some time after that. She was mostly out of costume in the early issues of Wolverine's solo title of all things. In that time, two more Spider-Women would appear. The first was Madame Web in Amazing Spider-Man number 210. She's not technically a Spider-Woman, I know, but just shut up, this is going to take two minutes and it'll come back later. Cassandra Webb is an elderly blind woman who can see more than others thanks to her mutant ability that gives her clairvoyance and precognition. She's also got a neuromuscular junction disease that leaves her connected to a life support machine that looks like a big old web. She was often a supporting character in the Spider-Man books, often helping him out with her abilities. She is the grandmother of someone we're going to talk about in a little bit, and sadly she was killed by Sasha Cravenoff during the Grim Hunt storyline. But we're going to touch on that again in a little bit anyway. Julia Carpenter was the second heroine to go by the name Spider-Woman, and and her first appearance was in Secret Wars number 6, but that was just in Shadow, so really, number 7. So we'll just talk about number 7. If you're unfamiliar with what the Secret Wars was, it was a creation of the editor-in-chief at the time, Jim Shooter, and the toy company Mattel. It was a big tie-in series to go with a toy line, and focus group testing showed that kids loved to play with toys that had wars in the title, and also the word secret. Jim Shooter decided that he was the only man to write this, and thus was born Secret Wars. And Julia Carpenter was created as the new Spider-Woman because he figured we needed one. In the pages themselves, a powerful cosmic being known as the Beyonder brought together pieces from many planets to form Battle World, where he also brought together heroes and villains from Earth just to have them fight it out. One of the pieces of the planets he bought happened to be a suburb of Denver, and this is where the new Spider-Woman happened to be. We don't see her origin just yet, but... Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. She just kind of shows up and helps the heroes. She does pull her weight, though, tossing around the Absorbing Man. This Spider-Woman would actually go on to join the West Coast Avengers, Force Works, and even Omega Flight, as well as many team-ups in her own limited series that would deliver on her origin. The government actually injected her with spider venom and plant extracts, giving her Spider-Man-like powers. But she would eventually give up the hero life to raise her daughter, which once again left the mantle open for someone else. Though, once a Spider-Woman, always a Spider-Woman, and Julia Carpenter would return to hero work using the name Arachne. Maddie Franklin first appeared in Spectacular Spider-Man number 263 in the summer of 1998, but again, just as a shadow. Why do they keep doing it in shadow. She would make her first full appearance in Amazing Spider-Man number 441, which was actually the final issue of Volume 1 of The Amazing Spider-Man. And in this issue, we actually get her origin. It has to do with Spider-Man, I think. She was part of a ritual called the Gathering of Five. She had taken her father's place alongside Norman Osborn, Madam Webb, Morris Maxwell, and Override. Care to guess which two of them aren't important? Anyway, the point of this ritual is that there are five gifts given, one to each of the participants at random. Power, knowledge, immortality, insanity, and death. Obviously, some are better than others. So they perform the ritual, and Override dies, more or less. 
Maxwell gets the knowledge, Madame Webb gets immortality, which I guess didn't stick, and Norman Osborn got the insanity and became the Green Goblin again while young Maddie Franklin got the power. It's also worth noting that she is J. Jonah Jameson's niece and a big fan of Spider-Man. Thinks he's cool. So speaking of Spider-Man, after this whole Green Goblin thing, Peter actually took a break from being Spider-Man. He made a promise to Mary Jane and he stays true to it for a while. Then in the all-new Amazing Spider-Man number one that literally came out two months later, a new Spider-Man showed up and a couple of issues went by before we learned that was Maddie Franklin dressed as Spider-Man. In Spider-Man number five, she made her proper debut with her own costume and took on the name Spider-Woman. Interestingly enough, at that very same time, in that very same issue, there would be a fourth woman to take on the name Spider-Woman. This was Charlotte Witter, and she's the granddaughter of Madame Webb, who I told you would come back around later. She made her mark by seemingly murdering Jessica Drew and Julia Carpenter, and she came looking for Maddie Franklin. In the next issue, we get her origin, and... Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. This one kinda does, though. She was created by Doc Ock, who intended to use her to kill Spider-Man uh, after she got done draining the power from the other Spider-Women. And in Spider-Woman Volume 3, Issue Number 1, all the good Spider-Women team up to stop the evil one. The next first appearance of Spider-Woman wasn't actually Spider-Woman at all, but she would have been had Brian Michael Bendis had his way, which at that point he didn't have as much pull as he does now. Or then. At some point. Alias. Jessica Jones. So the story goes that... Brian Michael Bendis was coming hot off of uh, Daredevil, and I think he was doing Ultimate Spider-Man by that point, and he was doing this detective comic that was gonna be for the Max title, and he wanted to be a detective, and he wanted to be Jessica Drew. I've heard that Marvel was like, nah, and then I thought he was like, nah, you know what, I've created this, she's become her own character, she doesn't need to be Spider-Woman, she can be someone else, so he created Jessica Jones, who, you know, went on to have a Netflix show, and she's part of the Avengers, she married Luke Cage. Just saying, that was almost Spider-Woman, not a big deal. But Jessica Drew did make a few appearances in that series. Our next first appearance of a Spider-Woman takes us all the way to 2004. In Amazing Fantasy number one, over the first six issues, we meet Anya Carazon, who would become better known to the world as Araña, which I'm pretty sure is Spanish for spider. Anyway, she was a high school student who, through some comic book hijinks, wound up getting stabbed with a mystical weapon while on sacred ground. It happens to the best of us, right? Next thing she knows, she's waking up in a web cocoon with a new tattoo that gives her spider powers and armor. From there, Aranya would go on to her own series in Amazing Fantasy uh, that was actually an anthology that featured several new characters. With issue 7, it was going to pivot to a new female scorpion who had nothing to do with the previous scorpion, who I did a video about. Aranya would go on to make several appearances across the Marvel Universe, and one of my personal favorites was a Marvel team-up story by Robert Kirkman and his team up and had like the League of Losers and these people came back from the future to kill everybody that was of relevance and they left out a bunch of people. Anyway, Aranya got her arm chopped off and Terror Inc. picked it up and put it, because he also lost an arm, so he used her arm. And throughout the rest of the series, <laughs> she was credited as Aranya's arm. And if you don't know who Terror Inc. is and you're curious, let me know in the comments below because I would love to do a deep dive on Terror Inc. I honestly might anyway if I find time between other projects. Anyway, in time, Aranya would take on a more traditional Spider-Folk costume with the look of Julia Carpenter's Spider-Woman, and she would actually give in and take on the name Spider-Girl. Moving along chronologically, the next one was from Bendis again in 2005, also not really a Spider-Woman, but kind of, sort of, yes. Jessica Drew wound up back in her costume to join the Avengers in New Avengers number one. Why is this considered a first appearance? As if a return to her costume isn't enough? It's actually the first appearance of Varanki the Squall Queen, posing as Spider-Woman to prepare for the secret invasion. And then when I started writing this, I thought, you can't really do a many first appearances of a Marvel character without talking about the Ultimate Universe, so I was thinking I would talk about Ultimate, which I will, but honestly, there's a lot of first appearances here to talk about anyway. Ultimate Spider-Woman debuted in Ultimate Spider-Man number 98 by Brian Michael Bendis again and Mark Bagley in their attempt to take on and do their own clone saga. And she was just that, she was a clone, a female clone of Peter Parker, and Jessica Drew was the name given to her by her handlers, whoever made her. Who made her? CIA? Somebody trained her and they wanted to use her as an agent, so she got the name Jessica Drew and she kept it and went off. She actually made plenty more appearances in the Ultimate Universe and a few in 616 Regular Universe, which I didn't know about until like three minutes ago. An honorable mention to Ashley Barton from the Old Man Logan Universe. She's the daughter of Hawkeye and the granddaughter of Spider-Man. First appearing in 2008's Wolverine number 67, created by Mark Millar and Steve McNiven, and she went by the name Spider-Bitch and I really like the way she looks. 2010 brings us up to the Grim Hunt, which I said we would talk about in a bit because it does affect several spider women. Craven the Hunter and his family basically decided that it was open season on spider people. Uh, really, Craven was looking for Spider-Man to end his life, but this video I'm making does not has to do with Spider-Man. It's about the spider women. Madam Web and Maddie Franklin were captured and eventually killed, while Julia Carpenter will become the new Madam Web. Blindness and precognition and everything. See, I told you there were major consequences for some of these women. And that's not the only major consequence. Like, this is where Aranya got that costume I was talking about, so. 
pretty big changes. Uh, another honorable mention for a Spider-Woman is Gwen Stacy, better known as Spider-Gwen, but actually known as the Ghost Spider. She was created in 2014 by Dan Slott for the Spider-Verse storyline and is from an alternate dimension where Gwen Stacy was bit by the spider and Peter Parker was actually turned into the lizard. But you know about Spider-Gwen, she's in like the Spider-Verse movies, you've seen them. I know you have. If you haven't seen the Spider-Verse movies, <laughs> like and subscribe, but comment down below how you've just not seen them. Final first appearance we have of a Spider-Woman is from April, also 2014, and also created by Dan Slott, who had a big year creating Spider-Women, because like, that was the year of the Spider-Verse, and there were many Spider-People created by Dan Slott in that. Anyway, it's Silk, Cindy Lou Who. Nope, Cindy Moon. I always want to say Cindy Moon Who. Anyway, Cindy Moon was actually bitten by the same spider that bit Peter and developed similar powers, though she has organic webbing. But she was found by Ezekiel right away and he locked her up in a bunker to shield her from more Lun. And then a bunch of secrets got revealed in Original Sin because like the orb exploded the Watcher's eye, comic books. Then Peter found her and let her out and the two of them could not stop banging. Like it was something in their radioactive spider blood or their spider senses just started going and when they were near each other, they had to do it. They wouldn't not do it. They just, they had to do it. They couldn't stop. And this is where it kind of becomes a little strange for me rereading that stuff. Not terribly strange, but over the next few years, Silk would kind of change and become more of a teenage character. Like she joined the champions, though she wasn't a teenager. And they do uh, hang a lampshade on it. They talk about it like how she's like the same age as Spider-Woman and she's actually three years older than Spider-Man and maybe being locked in a bunker is why she acts like a teenager. It's like they never directly made her a teenager, but they made her more teenager-like and I guess maybe it does make sense. So it's not that bad. Don't worry about it. Spider-Man is on the up and up with his sexual engagements. Yeah. It's fine. She was in a bunker. She's like Spider-Man Kimi Schmidt. I'm fine with that. But Silk would actually help a lot during the whole Spider-Verse whenever that came up. As I said, she worked with the Champions. She worked with the Agents of Atlas. She's actually technically in the MCU. As of this recording, she has had no less than five solo series. And I don't know if that's a really good thing or kind of sad. But Silk, like, I, I know about Silk. I was reading comics at the time she came out and she's, she's always been there, but it seems like she's never quite got that big break. And maybe I'm wrong. But there you have the many first appearances of Spider-Woman. At least four of these people I mentioned are in the new Madam Web movie coming out. I think it's out this week, depending on when I upload this video. I'm probably not going to it because quite frankly, after Morbius, I've made the conscious decision to not trust Sony with their movies unless- it Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. If you learned something new here about Spider-Woman or you watched Madam Web and think I should go see it, please let me know down in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe if you're new here. Like this video, because that does help the algorithm and I uh, appreciate all the help I can get. Be sure to come back next time for more of this type of Hossman content. We're gonna talk about Sabretooth coming up. 76, the bionic female, bionic female? The bionic woman spun out of her male counterpart, the six mil, we're spun off of the show, The Bionic Man. Not The Bionic Man, Jesus Christ. But before she does, the Hydralita, count the Hydralita. And the final, the final first, and to this day, she has actually had five, actually, 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 actually,